will be uh, NDR, obviously it goes with the NDS. So we'll deal with the NDR, then a national question, then we'll address the last item, why revolutionaries need Marxism. So we can take uh, those issues. Amanda! Away. Amanda! Away. Chairperson of Corsas Suwit, a former chairperson of ANC Youth Board 7, in the lady and a member of Dr. RSM, ANC Youth League RTT, and is currently a member of the ANC Provincial Subcommittee on Political Education and Training. 
He holds multiple merits for the purpose of our session. He must unpack the history of the ENC, the role of Ikeda, and talk to the issue of the middle class, black middle class in particular. Amanda! I'll just give you the overview of, of how I'll make the presentation. We'll start with the history from 1652 to 1911. Speak about the anglo boer Wars, a little bit about the anglo boer Wars, the Union of South Africa, go to the formation of the ANC, because the ANC, the ANC is long and it's a lot of um, it's rich in history. It cannot be said in this little time. So what, what I've decided to do, I will talk about the key events and watershed moments. Comrades, um, briefly, from 1652 to 1911, we know that South Africa was conquered, was conquered by force and true violence. Um, this began with the arrival of, of the white settlers in 1652. The, the arrival of Jan, Jan van Riebeek from the Netherlands in 1652 was the beginning of misery for the indigenous people of South Africa. The arrival of Jan van Riebeek was followed by arrival of other settlers from Germany and later by settlers from England. The total takeover of South Africa and dominance of the white settler was then enhanced by the arrival of the British military forces at the end of the Napoleon Wars. I'm sure comrades will know about the Napoleon Wars. At the end of the Napoleon Wars, Britain was recovering from the Bruising War and was struggling economically. With many soldiers and citizens which were sent to South Africa to start a new life. Many wars erupted between the settlers and the indigenous people, with the Khoi people and the Sain people being the first people to resist um, the settlers. So our revolution started in earnest in 1652, when the first Khoisans um, threw a bow and arrow to, to the um, contingent of Jan van der Beek. That was when the revolution started. The Khoisan, the Khoi and the Sen people were then defeated and they were almost extinct after, after, after the one of the settlers. Then there were wars between the African kingdoms and the settlers. However, the African kingdoms were still independent. Then the game changer became with the arrival of the British troops in 1795. The arrival of the British troops shortly after the end of the Napoleon Wars, others began in the middle of the Napoleon Wars. These arrivals marked the beginning of untold suffering for our people through, col through colonialism, imperialism and later to apartheid. Africans experienced subjugation, murder, torture, humiliation and discrimination among other heinous crimes of this uh, colonial and apartheid. The natural resources were plundered and looted. Cattle were violently taken from the African people. The Khoi and San were almost exterminated and in 1850 to the late 1800s the African kingdoms were defeated. After the end of the hard fought battle of Isandwana, which was led by Chief Tetua. Then we know the frontier wars, which lasted 100 years. The frontier wars were between the Corsa people and the English. 
hundred years of fighting almost every day. Those were the French wars, which also ended in the 1888. Between 1879 and 1896, the Zulu Kingdom was defeated. And later in 1906, Bambata was Bambata Rebellion was defeated, which was led by Chief Bambata. In the in the 1970s, the Pedi Kingdom were invaded and defeated. The Sutu were also defeated after King Mushosho's successor accepted to disarm. In 1866, the pressure was put on the Swazi leaders to submit. In 1822, the Twana were defeated when Chief Munsiwa was forced to surrender in Afikeng. In 1881, Chief Mankuru Anem attacked a colonial settlement in Mamusa. However, he was defeated in 1883. He was forced to give up his land to the Stella Lande missionaries. In 1880s, the Venda people were defeated after the resistance by King Makado and later King Bishu was defeated. That's when the Tsonga people were defeated. So we see the trend. It was the defeat of the Khoisans uh, in the Cape, the defeat of the uh, Kosa kings in, the, in KZN, the defeat of the Zulu kings in, in the Free State, the defeat of King Shashwe. In Northwest, the defeat of King and Chief Mangurane and Chief Mutsiwa upwards until the defeat of uh, King Sobuza in Swaziland. Immediately after the defeat of the African kingdoms, another war erupted between the Anglo, the, the English, and the Boers. Now, the Boers were a people, was a group of people who were mainly from Dutch, from Netherlands and people from Germany and some from France. They were called the Boers because they were engaged in farming. That's where the term came to. At the same time, there was the English from, the Eng from England. Now, the war erupted between British colonizers and the Boers from Transvaal and Free State. The first war began in, in Purchase Road. It was between 1980 and 1881. And the second, Anglo War War was between 1899 and 1902. These wars were essential about the control of South Africa and its resources between the British and the Boers. This was mainly due to the discovery of diamond in Kimberley and gold in the Vilbertus Rand. And it was about the ownership of, of South Africa. The Second Anglo War was mainly due to the gold rush following the discovery of gold in Transvaal in 1885 at Witwatersrand and the reef. The, the, British, the British military was too strong for the Boers. The Boers were, de were defeated and they surrendered, they, they surrendered. Another problem with the English, the English they had with the Boers was that uh, they thought the Boers were having a treaty with Germany, and the Germany at that time was advancing towards conquering Namibia. So the English were not happy with the presence of the Germans around. And then at the end of the Anglo Boer War, a treaty was signed. The war ended with a treaty which was signed at Fernache. 22,000 British troops had died, and over 25,000 Boer civilians had died. The treaty ended, ended the existence of Transvaal and the, and the Orange Free State. So Transvaal, Orange Free State were the republics of the Boers. They were then captured by the British Empire to form one colony. But then the, the Boers were then compensated for their losses. They were given three million pounds after their defeat. So you can do your calculation how much was three million pounds of work then the early, um, in the early 1900s. A form of, of constitutional monarch. So we had a government in South Africa, but the, the, the monarchy, the king, was in, in Britain. The first monarch of the Union of South Africa was King George the fifth and the prime the first prime minister was Louis Porter 
followed by Jan Smart, followed by uh, Herzog, followed by Jeff Malan, J.G. Strodom, and later H.F. Fairwood. The union came to an end when, in 1961, the Constitution was enacted. On 31 May 1961, the union became a republic under the name of Republic of South Africa. So, on, so the union was there from 1910 until 1961. Then it became Republic of South, of South Africa. The union had four capital cities. So Cape Town was the legislative capital city. Pretoria was the administrative capital city. Bloemfontein was the judicial capital city. And Damaris Bay was the archival uh, capital city. Now, we come to the formation of the ANC. Now, when this union was formed and during the anglo war, uh, let's observe in this situation in their country that people have come here, have conquered us, now they are fighting over our resources, they are dividing the country amongst themselves. So the, the very rich class already started discussions in the early 1900s. 1800s and early 1900s. It was clear that discussions between the Boer republics and the British were excluding, were excluding Africans from political participation. In 1909, a group of black delegates from four provinces met uh, in a place called Vaihu in Bloemfontein to propose a means to the draft of the South African Act and the It was later dissolved. Pixley Isaac Agaseme, a lawyer who was educated overseas, recognized that there's, there was no national representative and a dynamic organization that represented like interests in South Africa. Seme was a graduate with BA from the University of Columbus in the US, and he had later studied law uh, for a law degree at Oxford University in England. He was a very brilliant guy, to such extent that his speech in Columbia University on the regeneration of Africa won him the highest oratorial, um, oratorical accolade, which was called the George Williams Curtis Medal. Now, this, this medal he got, he competed with um, a man who, who later became the president of um, USA. Um, Franklin Roosevelt. So Peter Sakasem was so brilliant that he beat uh, Roosevelt in the debate. On his return in South Africa, Peter Sakasem met three other lawyers. I think we must um, note the name of these other gentlemen who, who helped with the formation of the ANC because it was not only Sam who did it. We must note the name of these other three lawyers. Alfred Mangena, Richard Nsimang and George Mutsiwa. George Mutsiwa was from here in Africa. So here in the Northwest, we also found a, mem found a member of the ANC. These four lawyers organized an inaugural, an inaugural conference to launch what we call now the South African <coughs> National Native Congress, SANNC. Dr. John Langalwale Dube was elected the first president in absentia. Sol Plaji was elected the secretary general. Pixley, Chief McLean of Pondoland, Chief Munsiwa of Barolo, Chief Mubei Bakata. They were, they were present in that conference and they were made honorary president. And in 1923, SANNC was renamed the African National Congress, as we know it today. What were the ideals and strategic objectives of the uh, SANNC as it was formed? Now, NC was formed mainly to have one voice for black people in South Africa. And the first constitution of the NC around the first, the first five basic aims. So these were the aims of the NC 
as they said, in 1912 conference. The first, the first um, uh, principle was that to promote unity and mutual cooperation between the government and the South African black people. Point number two, to maintain a channel between the government and the black people. Point number three, to promote the social, educational, and political upliftment of black people. Point number four, to promote understanding between the chiefs and pledge loyalty to the British Crown and all lawful authorities, and to promote understanding between white and black South Africans. Fifth uh, principle of the front position of the NC was to address the just grievances of black people. Now, I think we agree, all of us agree that these five principles were not radical at all. They were a little bit of sweetheart to the then uh, uh, Union of South Africa and the British. Now, the non radical five basic aims went to England in 1913 to raise concerns about this law, and they went again in 1919 without positive response from the British government and the monarch. Another key event and watershed moment in the NC then became the election of Josiah T. Kumete as the president of the NC. J. T. Kumete. He was elected the president of the NC in 1927. Now, in the 1920s, the government passed policies that were becoming harsher and more repressive. There were laws excluding blacks from holding skilled jobs in number of industries, in number of industries uh, which were passed by the government. President Kumede sought to revitalize the NC and fight these laws. Um, I think in, in the following presentations, comrades will go deeper on, on, this, on the issue of um, the National Democratic Revolution and um, how did it come about into the ANC. Now, comrade Kumede was close to the leadership of the Communist Party of South Africa. He then accompanied the leadership of the Communist Party of South Africa to the Communist International Conference. Because I'm also a doctor, <laughs> but because of what he has done, you see. Uh, Dr. Kuma established an office for the ANC. That the ANC should have an office. He started the concept of branches should have branches today. He took a loan from liberals uh, to fund the ANC and used money from his surgery to fund the ANC. Under the presidency of Dr. Thoma, ANC Women's League was, uh, was established and the ANC Youth League was formed. So it is based on those reasons that I say it was a, a landmark, not because it was he was in the same profession. <laughs> <laughs> Another landmark and um, a tipping point in watershed in the ANC will be the formation of the ANC Youth League in 1944. Now, the formation of the ANC Youth League was a total game changer. In December 1942, the ANC NEC authorized the formation of the ANC Youth League. The ANC Youth League would change the cause and direction of the struggle for freedom and brought some radical changes to the ANC. Dr. Koma told the ANC that there is a group of young people who were prepared to march barefoot against race oppression. <coughs> the young people uh, Dr. Koma was talking about included um, <coughs> Jordan Gubane, Nelson Mandela, A.P. Mida, Walter Sisulu, William Komo, Lionel Majumbosi, O.R. Tambo, Robert Sobukwe, and Anton, Anton uh, Mlung, um, Lungis Lembete, to mention the few. Now, Anton Lembete was considered a philosopher. The NCC promoted African, um, they came with a concept called African nationalism, which was uh, uh, penned by uh, uh, Lembete. African nationalism meant that Africans must struggle for development, progress, and national liberation, 
as to occupy the rightful and honorable place among nations of the world. Their motto was Africa, Africa's keys must hide. Now these young people are no longer talking the language of the old people. They are not longer talking about South Africa, they are talking about Africa in general. The Institute League, after, immediately after it was formed, they criticized the ANC severely. They criticized the ANC for being unable to advance the national cause in a manner commensurable with the demand of times. They said the ANC is organizational weak. They said the ANC is yielding to oppression. It's an organization of gentlemen. It fails to see the problems of the Africans through the proper perspective. The ANC click further said, and felt that the ANC is an organization of the privileged few, mostly conservative people, professionals and traders. They further thought the ANC was reactionary and was out of touch with the need, rank and files of the Africans. I'm not sure if Comrade Kubo was not regretting uh, the permission he gave to these young people from this organization. They further said the privileged few in the ANC are not an organized bunch and they are poorly organized. They said their thinking lacks the, the national bias and call for a radical stance against the government. They urge that if no action is taken about the direction of the ANC, then their forefather struggles would have been in vain. In, in, on the 2nd of April 1944, at the establishment of the Institute League at Bantu Men Club in Johannesburg, Antoine Lembete wrote this, which, which touched me there. I think we should um, listen to this. I open quote. Understanding of the use of the word comrade. By the word comrade, we mean more than a brother or a sister. We mean a fellow fighter for freedom and development, to whom we are tied by shared and solemn commitment to serve the population of South Africa. We use the word comrade as a soldier speak and about fellow combatants as comrades in arms. We use it to identify those in society who are ready and prepared to sacrifice everything to achieve the goals we have set ourselves as we engage in the struggle to er eradicate the legacy of colonialism and apartheid and achieve the objectives of a better life for all our people, close quote. That's how it defines what the community is. Now, therefore, as comrades, we have a big task of total eradication of the legacy of imperialism, colonialism, and apartheid which today manifests mainly as triple scourge of poverty, inequality, and unemployment. But then, again, Nelson Mandela talks something to what I think should be the role of the kingdom. Now, he was addressing the United Nations General Assembly in 1998, <coughs> as his term for South African presidency was coming to an end. He addressed the, the assembly, open quote, as I sit in Kuno and grow as ancient as its hill, I will continue to entertain the hope that the, I will continue to entertain the hope that there has emerged a cadre of leaders in my own country and region, on my, on my continent and the world, which will not allow that any should be denied freedom as we were, that they should be turned into refugees as we were, that they should be stripped of human dignity as we were, close the quote. Now, it is clear that from how Comrade uh, Masubu described a Comrade and what Madiba expects from us, that being a member of the NC is more than just joining the organization, coming to vote in the AGM, and disappearing from the radar until the next AGM or BGM. Membership of the NC means total commitment to the society to improve the quality of lives of our people, to understand the challenges that face our people, and to be in the forefront of fighting injustice. 
But to be a member of the NC, which is a leader of society, you need to be knowledgeable about the conditions that our people uh, are faced with. And your membership of the NC should be built on strong foundation. It is this um, strong foundation that one of the former um, supporters of the NC and an author of that era, uh, and a philosopher by the name of S. E. K. Mikai. In 1928, he posed a question, I open quote, how can anyone be grounded knowing nothing about his people? Whatever his efforts on support of the national issue, he cannot be well grounded. He can expect to be struck down senseless by a puny little word so that he falls flatly in his face because all along he was hoping in one leg. Close quote. Then Thomas Sankara further warns us, open quote, a soldier without ideological training is a potential criminal. So, so being an NC member who does not know the root of the NC, who formed the NC, why they formed the NC, what was the caliber of the people who formed the NC, what were the strategies, objectives of the NC is very difficult. If you don't know this thing, when we hear that uh, Dr. Ambuto is a member of the NC, I think those who, after this lecture you will you 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 will shake each other. So the NC was formed by the middle class and led by the doctor. So so I think maybe some comrades are saying ish I've been I've been ignored. So if you don't understand these issues, you become ignorant. Therefore, we need members of the NC who are well grounded to be able to achieve the strategic objectives of our forefathers. Hence, political education, like this forum, are the most potent people for, for, for it or effective tools to deal with the right wing liberal organization, populist demagogues, ultra leftist organization who contest the political space with the NC, and also not to betray the ideals of our family fathers. Then the former president of the ANC Youth League once wrote, I open quote, militancy devoid of clear understanding of the historic mission of the movement, the historical task of the NDR, and the movement's high position in society could be counterproductive and result in anarchy being interpreted as revolutionary, or any anarchist or enemy being labeled as militant, close quote. Equally, this can be said of being a member of the NC. Being a member of the NC without understanding of the historical background of the NC, the reasons for the formation of the NC, the caliber of people who formed the NC, the, whole, the historical task of the NC, the strategic objectives of the NC, the mission of the NTR, the high standing of the NC in society, in South Africa, in Africa, and in the world general. It's problematic and may result in ill-discipline, betrayal of the revolution, foreign tendencies cropping up, which may result in the death of this giant of the movement. So, now there's a term I think we should, I don't, if we can forget everything from what I said, let's remember the term posterity, posterity. Now, the people who formed the NC had formed the NC for posterity. Posterity means you do something for the generations to come, not for the present generations. That's why he's still strong and good, strong and alive and going stronger 104 years later. So the NC was formed for posterity. Okay? Because the NC was formed for uh, posterity, it is this generation which must make sure that what they do, the NC lives another 100 years. How can I summarize quickly uh, the roles of the Kida? I think the first important role of the Kida, one, understand the history of the NC and its strategic objectives. Two, 
be able to debate and lead discussions about the national question. Thorough understanding of the national democratic revolution. We read the strategy and tactics document. We understand the Freedom Charter. We understand the constitution of the ANC. We lead on social issues and struggles of the people on the ground. We have active uh, branch subcommittees understand who are the motive forces and show the unity of the motive forces and frown upon any experiment of trying to divide uh, the progressive forces. Any experiment should be frowned upon. If the comrades will say, no, let's try it without COSATO, let's try it without SACP, let's try it without middle class. It can be an experiment that can go wrong. It's not experiment. Let's not take, make that experiment. So we should understand what the motive force is and show the unity of the motive forces. We must ensure that the NC does not lose state power. We must, we must ensure that um, the NC deploys in government adhere to the strategic objectives of the National Democratic Revolution. We should advocate for clean governance and be intolerant to corruption and fraud. We must always be knowledgeable about current affairs. Those are the issues I've picked. But then, in examining our responsibility towards building a stronger ANC to move South Africa forward, let us digest the words by Franz Fanon, one of the greatest revolutionaries. I open quote, each generation must, out of relative obscurity, discover its mission, fulfill it, trade, close quote. Now, each generation, the generation of the Khoisans of 1652, their mission was to stop the infant rebellion from advancing. And the other two lawyers who, who formed the NC was to unite the people. The mission of the next generation of the 1944 of the NC League was to fast forward the struggle and put some militants into the revolution. The mission of the generation of 1976 or to say no to Africans, and later they rendered the country the government. The mission of the early people of the 1990s was to make sure that the NC becomes strong and wins state power. Then, what is the mission of this generation, your generation, our generation? So let's identify our mission and, and say what is our mission. Because the first, I mean, I'm going to speak about the NDR, the first goal of the NDR we, we, we have achieved it, freedom, but what is our mission? But then let's not forget what uh, Dr. Kuma said, as I conclude, open quote, whoever will betray the principle of unity that gave birth to the ANC will be traitor to Africa. If you disturb the unity and you disturb the unity, the ANC, we are a traitor to the children of Africa. <laughs> Thanks for the opportunity and privilege to speak about uh, uh, this giant of a movement and the responsibility of the <laughs>
when Comrade Mlam uh, gives a presentation. After Comrade Mlam will then take uh, a lunch break or not so I call it now. Somehow. That <laughs> break for refreshments. Then we will present the last session. Amanda. Okay. Yeah, yeah,